We've been meeting for years, and now we're on KPNW. Welcome to Poetry Club. Join us as we discuss another exciting poet. You all ready? Oh, <laughs> ready? Yes. When did you go? <laughs> well, okay. There, there's a number of. Uh, approaches we could take to this uh, question about, set of questions about rhyme. Uh, I distributed some poems and I think we're all pretty familiar with almost virtually all of them. Uh, the article that Lynn sent me and I forwarded to y'all, uh, I thought had some interesting observations about the history of rhyme and uh, both the strengths of it in poetry and the perils. Uh, I'm kind of, I'm very interested in looking at the effects in the various poems that I sent you. That is, how does, what is the value added and how does rhyme really operate? Why do poets resort to it and et cetera? But it might, let me propose, that anybody can jump in whenever they like, but I'd like to make a few observations about the history of rhyme and then some general thoughts about why rhyme is useful and what the risks are, and then look at the poems as examples. You all right with that? Yes. Sounds good. But I I wanted to start by looking at the segments from Two is Coy Mistress and My Last Touches. In the history of the English usage of rhyme, I think this is the way rhyme has primarily been used. Rhyme has been a strong element in English poetry and European poetry for centuries. It's not uh, popular currently among poets and readers. And there are only a few people writing poems that are really insistent on rhyme. You all might not suspect that I know that uh, based on the stuff I've sent up that I've written. But I am, I'm aware that the stuff I'm writing is not really current. Uh, anyway, in To His Coy Mistress, had, I won't read all the poems as we look at them, but had we but whirled enough in time, this coyness lady were no crime. We would sit down and think which way to walk and pass our long love's day. That's iambic tetrameter, eight, eight syllables per line, eight beats per line. And a lot of classical English poetry uses rhyme the way Marvel does to set off a nugget of thought. And the rhyme kind of encapsulates it. If it's five syllables per line, uh, 10 syllables per line within rhyme, it's, we know, called a heroic couplet. And it's, that's the language primarily of the, of the epic in English poetry, especially during the 17th and 18th century. I've, Browning's poem then, with, with my classes over the years, I've read them, uh, Marvel's lines from Marvel and lines from Browning and said, all right, look at me and which one rhymes? And many, many of them will say that Browning's poem does not rhyme after they've heard Marvel's. But what Browning does is, that's my last duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. I call that piece a wonder now. Fra Pandolf's hands work busily a day, and there she stands. Browning relies on in Kathy's, one of Kathy's favorite words, enjambment, so that the sense of the sentence goes beyond the end of the line. And the rhyme actually becomes kind of muted. And poets throughout the years, I think, would say, let me back up. If I ask students coming into class, why do poets rhyme? I end up saying because they can. But students will tell me back what I learned when I was in eighth grade and what many of them learned. Their teachers told them that poets use rhymes so that 
it'll be easier to remember their poems. Well, we all know that poets don't write with trying to be merciful to their readers memorizing their lines. <laughs> and one explanation that I think comes through clearly in Marvel's poetry is that the rhyme reinforces theme. And you get important terms at the end of the line. And in Browning's case, poets through the years, and especially uh, John Dryden in an essay called uh, an essay on dramatic poesy, poetry says that the rhyme controls the fancy, the poet's fancy. And you tend to state ideas in a more compact uh, way uh, and even more intense. And so the rhyme forces them to be more cogent. And those, I think, are the primary two ways in which poets have relied on rhyme. A question, Ron? A question? What did the phrase rhyme reinforces the theme mean? I understand when you talk about structure, but you said reinforces the theme. Okay. Marvel's poem, To to His Coy Mistress, is about uh, him attempting to seduce her because their time is limited and they have limited space. And so space and time become motifs throughout the poem. And the rhyming terms, I think, in many instances, you can point out how they reinforce those themes. Okay. Okay. By the way, that's a terrible last line to his coy mistress. Yeah, it's not the last line, but it's it was a line a, a line that would have given been given a scent in the Renaissance. Mm. Right, but using those, I would love you two years before the flood. You should, if you please, refuse uh, refuse her her disinclination. Is is what he's fighting against, or? Her declining. So, I said I didn't want to talk about history, but I'll say a couple of things. Generally, I I don't think anyone can say for sure when rhyme poetry uh, showed up in English. Medieval poetry relied not on rhyme but on alliteration. If you read Beowulf in the original and in many of the translations, you get three consonants uh, per, per line. One in one half of the line and then two more in the other half. It's very, very regular. And most people would say that uh, Thomas Wyatt and the Earl of Surrey in their translations of Petrarch sonnets in the early 16th century were major influences in establishing rhyme as a regular element in English poetry. And if you want to do some research and more reading on just the history of rhyme, I think it's good to begin with Wyatt and Surrey. And historically, everybody deals with them. And I used to know who was the kind of mentor and who was the mentee. I think the Earl of Surrey was the mentee, but he's generally credited with Doing, providing the most variations and the most experimentation with rhyme in the poems that he wrote and in the translations that he did. After that, uh, there were many, many, you know, sonnet sequences in English. The question ar- early arose uh, about whether noblemen especially should be devoting their time to writing poetry. <laughs> Sir Philip Sidney has one of the early important documents in defense of writing poetry, and especially rhyming poetry, his defense of poesy. And that's another document that everyone begins with who tries to trace the origins and uh, the practices in English poetry. Another important document is the one I mentioned earlier, John Dryden's An Essay on Dramatic Poesy. 
Dryden was the first British poet laureate in 1660. And he's generally considered an 18th century poet, although he was writing in the 17th century because he, uh, his poetry does many of the, much of his poetry was imitated throughout the 18th century. His, he really takes up the question of whether it's legitimate and appropriate to use rhyme in writing plays because people don't ordinarily speak in rhyme. And uh, he raises the question for all of English poetry about how natural is rhyme and what does one give up by way of the natural uh, qualities in the language in order to have this artificial element imposed. The question of why a poet says, I'm going to rhyme this poem, I don't believe anyone can answer. That is, what is the essential appeal aside from music? And we'll see a number of different effects in the poems that we've looked at. All right, to start looking at the poems. One, one more thing. <laughs> uh, Robert Frost once famously said, playing, writing poetry without rhyme, and he did, is like playing tennis without a net. <laughs> that is, the rhyme provides a frame, mm -hmm. uh, and it's an extension, I think, of the argument that uh, it controls the writer's imagination. So, there are also dangers in using rhyme. Some people won't like it, but... Uh, we won't say who. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Almost all the poetry we read is by poets who use rhyme very skillfully and uh, masterfully. But there are a lot of bad poems out there, and many of them are bad because somebody tried to use rhyme and failed. There are big risks with it. If you look at Poe's poetry, it can be dismissed as virtuosity, just an attempt to look clever. It can be a distraction to the reader. Many people, again, I'll use Poe as an example, will read passages from The Raven and get so caught up in the music of the poem that they're not paying much attention to the sense of the poem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It can sabotage precision and other techniques in the poem. It can be strained. There are times we read poems, especially by the uh, people we know, <laughs> And we think that was that, that one stretched. That was a stretch for that rhyme. And it falls on a tin ear. Uh, it can have unintended effects. There's a very famous bad uh, couplet from an elegy on Queen Elizabeth. I'm sorry, Queen Victoria. That many of you may have heard. Uh, dust to dust, ashes to ashes, into the tomb, the great queen dashes. <laughs> anyway, the, the author has been mercifully forgotten. And there are very special problems in translation with rhyme. Richard Wilbur won uh, Pulitzer Prizes for his translations of Moliere's uh, The Misanthrope and then for Tartuffe because they're so uh, authentic, I'm told. I don't know Renaissance French. But <laughs> He, he, he didn't have to sacrifice the poetry or the meaning in order to provide a rhyme version in English. Again, Robert Frost once famously said about that issue, what gets lost in translation is the, is, is the poetry mm. when you attempt mm. to translate poetry. Yeah, yeah. that's wow. good. And it's one of the reasons I've not taught poems in translation. I thought it was enough to struggle with poems in English and not make claims about what we know. I, I was criticized for it in, the, in my poetry classes, but uh, I didn't pay any attention to that. So we looked at uh, some. We can come back to Marvel and Browning. But the reason I gave you Richard Corey those lines 
and I, I only included a few, but he was rich, yes, richer than a king and admirably schooled in every grace. In time, we thought that he was everything to make us wish that we were in his place. I think Robinson, as much as anyone, finds a very exact rhyming term, but it's it doesn't draw attention to itself. He also keeps the natural rhythm and the idiom <clears throat> in his poetry. Osmandius and Emily Dickinson, I gave you a couple of examples of slant rhyme or approximate rhyme. And you probably saw what they were. I met a traveler from an antique land who said to vast and trunkless legs of stone, stand in the desert near them on the sand, have sunk a shattered visage lies whose frown. And Emily Dickinson, if you read through Emily Dickinson's poetry, it is so ex experimental in its linguistics that is just its use of language. And uh, I always thought this one was a wonderful example. A slant rhyme in the first uh, quatrain, I like the look of agony because I know it's true. Men do not sham convulsion nor simulate a throw. But the second verse <laughs> stands a wow. The eyes glaze once and that is death, impossible to rain. The beads upon the forehead by homely anguish strung. So you get death and head and rain and strung as the echo terms. I mean, a really bold departure from a tradition of exact rhyme. Ron, I, I need to hear more about that. You know, I'm the one that gets unhappy with slant rhyme. I don't... What is Emily C. Dickinson slanting with what? Rain and strung? They're, they're echoing sounds. But what does that mean? Just the, uh, the rain, you actually get a sight of the inversion of the NG, but rain and strung, the strong N, and produces, along with the G, close to an approximate rhyme. In my view, she's not hampered by needing an exact rhyme. Mm. And death and head, a lot of poets would think, no, nah, can't do that. I like it that she did. Yeah. But, I mean, it seems to me the point is, whether you call it slanted rhyme or don't call it slanted rhyme, do you and do your senses <laughs> do you enjoy the poem, or yeah. does it make you strain? Like well, oh, because I enjoyed I, the poem before I ever understood that it was slanted rhyme. We're going to see even better examples in McLeish's poem, mm -hmm. which we'll look at in a minute. Greeson Hill. Emery, I probably didn't answer your question, but I think we'll come back to the question in a minute when we look at McLeish. I'm, I'm, I can enjoy the poem. I just don't, I just don't buy the relationship between the words. You mean describing them as a partial rhyme? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fine. Ron, I have a question. Um, how how much does accent play? in these rhymes? A lot. Emily Dickinson actually, in her original poems, provided accents throughout the poems. Ha. And mm -hmm. they didn't get transcribed for the most part uh, when Thomas Johnson edited her poems. Uh, Ron, in yeah. the first uh, stanza, of Dickinson's poem. How are you reading the? Uh, Which one? Which one? Uh, I look. I like a look of agony. What is the? Is there a rhyme scheme there that you're suggesting in the first stanza? No. No. You somebody somebody else might say that the G O N in agony. You hear an echo of it in the S I O N of convulsion. But mm. I wouldn't insist on that, and I know Amory wouldn't. Mm. 
But true and throw, I think he's is definitely an, a slant rhyme. Okay. Let's just look at the few lines from Breeden Hill, and then we'll take a long look at Ars Poetica. Uh, I've read uh, critiques of this poem. This is one of my favorite poems, Breeden Hill, that say that what you get in the triple rhyme is an echoing of the bells. Now, why someone makes a claim like that, I don't know. I wouldn't make it, but I, I've read other people. Uh, but the thing I like about the poem is, again, uh, I think uh, Hausman's genius is his ability to use plain language and just get a lot of poetic value out of it. So in Summertime on Breeden, the bells, they sound so clear. Round both the shires, they ring them in steeples far and near, a happy noise to hear. Here of a Sunday morning, my love and I would lie, see the colored counties and hear the lark so high about us in the sky. Go ahead, Lynn. Part of the rhyming scheme is also to be part of the syllables of the words. So, you know, I think that adds to the way that we interpret it as rhyme. Are you talking about Hausman's poem or poem rhyming in general? No, just the ones you just read. I was thinking that. Yeah. Be because the one syllable or the words he chooses are so distinct. Mm -hmm. you know, so clear and near, you know, they're just uh, Brandon, ring them. It's just part of it. I'm going to read through McLeish's poem, which is a really famous poem about how poetry should work and what should constitute a poem. And as an attempt to write about how poetry should operate, it's an interesting set of experiments. So the first stanza, look at how, I mean, you can't miss how he varies line length and meter and so on, but look at the variation in rhyme even in the first stanza. A poem should be palpable and mute as a globe, globe of truth. Uh, pretty much exact rhyme. Dumb as old medallions to the thumb. Silent as a sleeve worn stone of casement ledges where the most moss has grown, a poem should be wordless as the flight of birds. So you get the bird ass and the word ass at the end of the, that line. A bit of a departure from exact rhyme. <coughs> Second stanza, more so. Poem should be motionless in time as the moon climbs. Leaving as the moon releases twig by twig the night entangled trees. So you get rhyming vowels, but not really rhyming consonants. You get assonance without consonants. Leaving as the moon behind the winter leaves, memory by memory the mind. Doesn't attempt to rhyme at all, but you get some echoes of the vowels sounds from the previous uh, couplets. A poem should be motionless in time as the moon climbs. I always think that it's a mark of real confidence, if not genius. When do you repeat two lines instead of finding uh, another two lines? And then a poem should be equal to, not true. For all the history of grief, an empty doorway and a maple leaf, again, exact rhyme. For love, the leaning grasses and two lights above the sea, a poem should not mean, but be. So you get the rhyme, provide, I think a lot of people would say provides closure as it skips over those last couple of lines. In a couple of the poems I've given you, I've tried to use rhyme that way to close poems. And it's always a question of, how well did this go? 
So there's a real range of his uh, e effects in using rhyme throughout the poem. It'd be Brand interesting to say to him, McLeish, why do you think the rhyme is so essential? And if it is essential, why don't you use it more regularly? Why the departures? I really am trying to understand. I'm not being uh, difficult. Well, maybe both. Um, from this, time and climb to me rhyme. Time and climbs do not. How much leeway do you have? The S to me makes a difference. Sure. Do they still rhyme? Right. Do they still rhyme? I think there, are you, if you're asking me, I think there's a rhyme there, but it's not an exact rhyme. I think your question, how much leeway do you have, is a good one. Uh, can we take your question over to Margaret Atwood's poem, Passports? Sure. It's just that you named time and climbs as rhyming words. And, and I thought, no, not exactly. So, <laughs> Actually, I, I said that the first couple rhymes were exact, but he did, then he comes back to something closer to an exact rhyme with time and climbs. Ron, what? What do you think in a poem when there is exact rhymes and then they they stop? It's sort of like the poet is promising something to the reader, <laughs> mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden they jilt him. And mm -hmm. I think you your question is an extension. I'm sorry. I think your question is an extension of Amory's question. It, it how much. How much does a poet commit to a form throughout the poem in using rhyme either initially or in wrapping it with rhyme? I think we've seen examples of poets who don't feel that they need to worry about that. But most poets do. Most poets will use a rhyme scheme all the way through the poem if they're going to use it. So the, the fact that, that you are setting up some kind of a form in a poem, some kind of expectation in the reader, I, I think it's an entirely different question than near rhymes. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, has to, it has to do with the, the reader more than the poem. So I, I actually don't know what I'm asking. I don't really have the answer. I, I thought your your question was an extension of Amory's question, how much leeway does a poet mm. have? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, folks, I'm, I'm not here to defend it. I wanted to provide examples of, uh, <laughs> variate, of how, po how much poems, poets feel that they can vary. This mm. Margaret Atwood poem we looked at and we didn't say much about the rhyme, but it does really interesting things with oh, the rhymes. Can can I read through it? Yes. Yeah. Because I think it bear, it's a good example for the questions you're asking, Edwin. We save them as we save these curls called. Those curls called, that's, that's really the first echo. And it's alliteration plus the U sound. From mm -hmm. our kids' first haircuts, we might ask her, did you want three CU syllables? Did you do that deliberately? Or from lovers fell too early. Here are all of mine safe in a file, their corners clipped, each paged engraved with trips, clipped and trips, I barely remember. Yeah. Why was I wandering from there to there to there? God only knows, and the processions of wraiths Photos, nose, photos. We now get two exact end rhymes. Claiming to prove that I was me, the faces, grayish discs, the fish eyes. Look at the echoes through the two Fs, the discs and fish, ish on, at the end of gray, uh, gray and eyes, somewhat alike, trapped in the noon hour flash flare. 
with the sullen jack lit stare of a woman who's just been arrested sequence these pics are like a chart mm. of moon phases fading to black out or like a mermaid doomed to appear on shore every five years each time altered the renaissance they would have said altered to something a little more dead skin withering in the parching air picking up an eye a rhyme early in the poem and then the rap marooned hair thinning as it dries cursed if she smiles or cries and wraps it with a couplet. And if you, how regular is it? And then why, why the variance and why use rhyme at all? But clearly she's deliberately using echoing sounds, I would call them. And so beautifully, it's such a wonderful poem. And when you <laughs> hear it out loud, your ear can hear it. It really can. Uh, well, uh, and it. Shannon, I think many people would say, yeah, I heard it, but it was in the background. And what mm -hmm. it it doesn't overwhelm. It doesn't overpower. Well, you know what, <clears throat> you know what I love about passports is um, it's not that hard rhyme like Mother Goose. You know, we discussed Mother Goose. Uh, there were some poems sent out earlier this week that were Mother Goosey. Uh, but what I, there's this musicality in the lines that I really appreciate. And that is, in my opinion, this is my opinion, that is the true craftsmanship of poetry, where your words, each word is selected carefully. You do your best, I think, <laughs> uh, depending on your skill level, to really have this flow in the words, whether or not you're following a specific um, structure. You want your words to sound, uh, to have this 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 uh, flow to them, and uh, I'll give you a sh I'll give you a harsh example. Um, I went to I used to attend a um, poetry open mic, and it was um, novice poets, and I'm not blaming anybody. This isn't hate. This isn't hate speech or anything. <laughs> but I but. What they had done, and it was very obvious to me, and maybe you've heard these poems before at an open mic, is they took a prose, not a prose poem, um, and I'll even go so far as to say they took a paragraph from a memoir, and they lined it up. The only thing they did was format it as a poem. But what gave it away was when it was read out loud. When it was read out loud, it sounded like an excerpt from a novel or a short story. Even though the form was a poem, my ear, and I'm just, again, I apologize, but my ear could tell it, this is not a poem. This is an excerpt from a diary. Um, this is a short story. Maybe this is a page of a novel. But is it a poem? Am I, just because you've put it in stanzas and you've, You've lined it up nicely on a page with spaces. For me, my opinion, I say no. Unless you have crafted those words and and looked at it, read it out loud. <coughs> it, I mean, it's not a poem until it's a poem. And that that's all I have to say. <laughs> I love the music and these poems and these examples. And you can hear it not just on that last word of the line but throughout each line. I love it, love it. I'm just loving it. Thank you, Juan, for these great examples. So, so we have these large questions about how much leeway does a poet allow. Any, even practice great, great poets would not come to agreement about the questions that we're considering. How much leeway does a poet have? Let's take a look at Poe's poems that I gave you, uh, The Raven, which we already looked at four years ago, and I made the same comment. Poems, Poe, you get the whole package. Alliteration, rhyme, onomatopoeia throughout his, his poetry. <laughs> and sometimes, especially where in Annabelle Lee, which we I didn't give you, but I think we looked at before, a poem about the death of a young woman 
where the the almost rousing rhythm and sound of the poem uh, goes against theme. It, it it doesn't sound like a dirge, but here, once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, uh, I don't have have to read the rest. Just a lot of echoing, and for the most part, he manages it really well. When I was taught this poem in eighth grade, mm -hmm. I was taught by a teacher who thought that Poe was a genius, as many many people do. And that this was pure poetry. <laughs> Emerson, as I've told you before, called him the jingle man. The jingle man. <laughs> and then uh, one of the great failures for me in American literature, this stanza that we looked at before. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping, somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. That is, is a strain, I might go, but it gets worse. Let me see then what thereat is, and this <laughs> mystery explore. <laughs> Poe needed an editor to say to him, Edgar, you've gone too far. <laughs> <laughs> and then the bells, I mean, the bells, I don't know how many of you know the bells, I think we all get taught this poem early on, but Maybe for sheer virtuosity, hear the sledges with the bells, silver bells, what a world of merriment their melody foretells. How they tinkle, tinkle, tinkle in the icy air of night, while the stars that over sprinkle all the heavens seem to twinkle with crystalline delight, keeping time, time, time in a sort of runic rhyme to the tintinabulation that so musically wells. From the bells, 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 from the jingling and the tinkling of the bell. And he uses that exact same rhyme scheme in every stanza of this very long poem. It isn't just the rhymes within each stanza. It's the pattern. It, it's kind of amazing. Hmm. Uh, amazing that he would do that, or amazing uh, is he crazy, or what? <laughs> well, I think those are good questions. <laughs> uh, I could not do it, I admit that, but I would not do it. Uh, I would not attempt it. And on the one hand, you read it and you think, holy cow, that's something. In Minnesota, they would say that's different. <laughs> but uh, I think it, it raises a lot of the questions that we're asking, and not just how much leeway does a poet give, but how much does a poet have to re adhere to his commitment? And then how do you how do you gauge the commitment? How do you uh, how, how do you limit your promise? It doesn't matter. I mean, I think that you, if you're a poet, you have a story to tell. And so rhyme is one of your tools that you're using. I, I think you can um, pick it up in different parts of the poem. Um, I, what I like what you've described here is like they're using rhythm or rhymes and being cautious about it because you, there are some risks that you take when you use um, rhymes. But done well, it can really enhance in the, the story and what you're what you're listening to and how it how you hear it so I Those think Poe's Poe wrote poems that are such products of a virtuoso they're probably the most widely admired poems that are sheer displays of virtuosity and that's an admiring comment well, Poe's good at it. I mean, it, it, I think we kind of gravitate towards things we're good at or that interest us. So I think Poe was, he really liked the, he liked that rhyming stuff. So he was going to make sure that he, that was part of his style. I always think of Poe leaving his writing desk and going down and saying to the woman he was currently living with, stop <laughs> me before I rhyme again. <laughs> <laughs> Do 
It would be really interesting if he had lived 80 years instead of 40. And if we had a sense of what that meant, would mean to how he saw rhyme and meter and poetry and his accomplishments as a young man. Yes, I grow old, I grow bold. My phone still fit the mold. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, that was just off the cuff. (laughs) So quite a cuff you've got. (laughs) We can come back to these either today or sometime, but let's take a look at Frost Stopping by Woods, a poem that's really very well known. Uh, But I really like what he attempts and what he succeeds in doing. What what is remarkable in this poem, most people would say, is the interlocking rhyme in the stanzas. Uh, I will catch you later on that. Stopping my woods on a snowy evening. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near. Between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to see, ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep, but I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. In the last six lines, he uses the same rhyme, repeats the line at the end of the poem, and he makes some very interesting choices. But for all the rhyme in the poem, it's to me like Robinson's and Hausman's. They're not... Uh, clashing. You know, they're, they're still somewhat muted, even though they echo one another. But why, you know, we can admire, I think, how he interlocks the stanzas. But why does that, does that make it a better poem? Does it make it even tec- technically more uh, of an achievement? Because we still have the question of what is the value added? It works for me, but I couldn't tell you exactly why. That's my story on rhyme, folks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Anyone? Is there, um, for a, uh, I'll say, professional poet during those times, someone, an actual poet of employment, um, is there any sense of sarcasm there where they're kind of, in your opinion, Ron, where they're kind of taking a childhood, uh, a childlike um, activity and forming it into adult thoughts? Is that, is that, is that a factor at all? It's just a cur- some, something I'm curious about. I'll give, your- you, I'll give you two examples from what I think I hear in your question. Okay. <laughs> There are a lot of bad poets writing in the 18th century. And the one thing they could all do was write. You know, you go over to Hallmark and see that there are people writing greeting cards that are mad about rhyme. <laughs> and for all their practice, they don't get better at it. Uh, <laughs> Alexander Pope writes the essay on criticism, I think around 1711. And he writes it because there are so many bad poets writing in England. And he tries to tell people uh, how poetry is supposed to work. And there are two really famous couplets. One is, true wit is writing, true true wit is nature to advantage dressed. What what oft was thought, but ne'er so well expressed. So it's not an original thought. It's that you put thought so forcefully. And then later in the poem, he talks about poetic devices. And he says, "'Tis not enough, no harshness gives offense. The sound must seem an echo to the sense. "'Tis not enough, no harshness gives offense. The sound must seem an echo to the sense. 
all of the elements have to work together in order to produce a worthy poem. Probably the most uh, disdainfully mocked poet among the poet laureates was Kali Sibber. Uh, and I don't know a damn thing aside from his name, except I haven't read Kali Sibber, but I've read a lot that was written about Kali Sibber. C-O-W-L-E-Y-C-I-B-B-E-R. And nobody writes admiringly of Kali Sibber. So if you want to look at a bad poem, I don't, I don't know if I hit the mark on your question, Shannon. Um, yeah, I think so. It, it sounds like um, rhyming was, um, could I say, commonly known in those time periods? Especially in the 18th century, virtually everyone wrote in rhyme couplets. Mm-hmm. Ron, would you yep. please uh, repeat the f- first um, lines that you said about Alexander Pope's um, poetry? <clears throat> true wit is n- is nature. True, true wit. Uh, true wit is nature to advantage dressed. What oft was thought, but ne- but ne'er so well expressed. It's from an essay on criticism. <laughs> Thank you. Say on criticism. I have the feeling that some of a, of a certain age, i.e., Emery's and I, and maybe Lynn's age, that we had some teacher or series of teachers beat into us that rhyming was like mathematics. In other words, one plus one is two, three plus three is six. And if your rhymes don't rhyme exactly, then the mathematics of your poetry is wrong. And I think it's difficult to un- unlearn that. And maybe because of the examples of so many nursery rhymes that were, that were perfect rhymes. So, so I really Ron, like the analogy, Linda. You, you are of that age. And I want to know that you have used some uh, slant rhyme or whatever we want name we want to give it in your poems. Why are you attracted to do that? Is that deliberate? Uh, you know that you remarked about the slant rhymes, especially in the poem that I wrote about the fortunate 500 uh, mm-hmm. dreams and claims, etc. I I like slant rhymes because it one you don't have to give up uh, sense or exactness in your thinking for the sake of finding an exact rhyme. And you very often that's what you have to do. Yeah, and I I've been happy about the results when I when I believe I've made that happen in my own poems. Uh, So it's less of a struggle for words that are exact rhymes that are also going to make good sense. Uh, I I repeated myself. But when I started teaching poetry, uh, I'll try not to tell you too much about my own life. All of my aptitude tests said I should be an engineer. And I was a math major for two years at University of Buffalo. And I took Great Poets as an elective, which ran from Chaucer to T.S. Eliot. It was a flunk out course for English majors. And I aced it both terms. I mean, of course I did. (laughs) It it was, and at the end of the course, I thought, who am I kidding? And went over and switched into English and American civilization uh, (laughs) when the course was over. But when I started teaching poetry, I had to unlearn things like why do poets rhyme and what I've been told about them and what do we admire about poems, and et cetera. And I, I had to actually kind of start from scratch. So, I think a lot of people quit learning about poetry about eighth grade. And so our impression of poetry is what we learned through eighth grade. And so if we don't, 
try to learn or beyond that, then, then we get stuck in some of what our expectations of poetry are and we limit that. So that's what I think is really valuable in this kind of uh, lesson that we've had today is that rhyming has lots of different meanings. It's a great way to uh, enhance a poem um, and help us, but it's not just about having those exact rhymes, the one plus one equals two. It's about other ways that we can add musicality and, and rhymes and inner slant rhymes inside the, into the poem. Yeah. One of the things that um, I do after I've written a poem and, and go back and doing editing is I'll look for places that I can substitute words that either rhyme or are near rhymes or something. And the the thing that I like about not necessarily end rhymes, but sounds in the words that sound uh, sound the same in a poem, is it takes me out of the linearity of thinking about what the poem is saying and it connects me to something else, something that's that's beyond just a string of words. So I really like um, rhy rhymes, whether they're in end lines or in the middle of the line. You know, folks, over the years, I talk, I've said, a, made a lot of comments to students about poems that rhyme. But I'm not overstating it. In putting together my thoughts for this little event we just had, Mm -hmm. I really had to think in a different way about these issues than I re ever have before. Just think much more deliberately about them. And it was an, a wonderful exploration for me. <laughs> I, I applaud you. Uh, I think we all have to keep learning. And it's kind of interesting to for someone who has taught poetry for 50 years to say, I can still build on that, and uh, and I feel refreshed by the by the examples that you put together. Even though I've encountered these examples both in your class and in my in my own background, so I found it enlightening. Thank you. That is wonderful, and even though it's it's a mystery that isn't solvable, there's still mystery there involved. Um, well, I can't wait till we get to Rena Priest next week, because <laughs> one of the poems I'm going to send you, you'll see it, is such a departure, and mostly because she uses a conventional sonnet form, and some of the most surprising rhymes in the poem. Uh, hope I haven't given too much away here. <laughs> Amory, you've had your hand up. Do you have something yeah. you want to add? Um, oh, I know. I know what it was. I, I'm not completely willing to give up uh, the idea that rhyme helps with memorization. Um, I, because I keep thinking of, I mean, you're talking about poets who are writing in the 1600s. Um, I think back to oral tradition, storytellers that needed to tell what they were telling in such a way that it could be memorized so that it could be handed down. And I just have a feeling that in the bowels of poetry, some of that is, that is also true before everybody could easily get a written copy of something, one way to help it be easierly, <coughs> easierly more easily learned is by having a, a pattern, a sound to it. So I'm making up a theory as I go along. Well, okay. it's an interesting one. This guy talks all about using alliteration, rhyming, organization to improve your memory. It's very interesting. I, I um, Emery said the word oral. And at the risk of, of ending this on a very bad note, I want to tell you what came to my mind. It's, it's the worst poem, but a very 
an ineffective poem that I wrote for one of my children. It's two lines, bear with me. <laughs> Extract your digit from your oral cavity, sucking your thumbs not good for you or me. <laughs> She hates that bravo, poem. Bravo. She hates that poem because I was trying to get her not to stuck, suck her thumb, but she, it, eventually we just bribed her, gave her money. It's unfortunate that it's too late to send it to Dr. Spock. <laughs> <laughs> she may have hated that poem, but she never forgot it. No, no. she didn't. That's true. And I would say that's a mark of something that's long lasting. <laughs> Uh, and one of the things that I so appreciate about today, um, Ron, is the idea that we do sometimes have to f unlearn what we learn. When I was in graduate yeah. school from 1990 to 1992, um, sonnets and rhyme and meter was out, free verse was in. And especially, syllables were out counting syllables and what i learned today was the syllabic count which i had never even thought about on so many of the poems that you shared with us and read to us today for example stopping by woods on a snowy evening is eight syllables every line i did not know he was doing that <laughs> yeah on yeah so thank you i've really been thinking back and learning a lot and uh, appreciate the discussion. Thank you, Betty. Yeah, Amory, yeah. thank you for being annoyed and bringing it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, Amory, if we are having trouble locating a subject, we'll ask you to identify another issue. Another issue that's <laughs> annoying me, yeah. Well, yes, we've had... I had always been um, really confused about translations of poetry. How can you do that? You know, just look at English versus, versus German and the length of the words. How do you translate and still have a poem? And I can, and, and rhyme. So there we go. I've led us into two interesting discussions. <laughs> see, what are the most, uh, you know, I really enjoyed all of the talks that we've had. I, I always go away on Saturday morning feeling really good about our interaction. When Sean talked about the translation, Merton's translation of Neruda's poem, I learned so much from his uh, mm -hmm. sensitive mm -hmm. analysis of that poem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think I'm a pretty damn good reader of poetry. He, he taught me something mm -hmm. and more than one thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's great. It's kind of amazing that we keep on doing this week after week. We never mm -hmm. run out of ideas. Uh, <laughs> we're stimulated. We like each other's company. It's just, it's this just is, a high point. This is going to be such a great ending to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, I you, you should have you it at the beginning. Me. Yeah. Kumbaya. I've, <laughs> I've selected 10 poems from. Rena Priest, and I think I can oh. promise you that we are going to have a fun discussion. Yeah. She, she has powerful poems. Yes, yes. Thank you for joining us today on Poetry Club. If you like what you heard and you want to hear more, search Poetry Club Talks wherever you get your podcast. Thanks again for listening.